Hey everybody, I'm here to read the next chapter of The Singing Tree to you. And we finished the wedding, and so we are on chapter five, and it's called For Conspicuous Bravery. Lily had been at the farm now for almost two months. The day after the wedding, her father brought her out, a sulky, silent Lily dressed in a plain blue dress that made her look what she was, a little girl. She suffered mother's hearty kiss without responding with even so much as a smile. And Kate might as well have been thin air for all the attention Lily paid to her. And so that's what the picture was from last time, Lily coming to the farm. When mother led her into the house to show her the room she had fixed up for my summer baby, father turned to Judge Cormos. Don't look so worried, Bella. She'll get used to us and have a good time. Oh, it isn't that, sighed the judge. She didn't mind coming here. I know she enjoyed her short visit with you at Easter. It's those confounded puppies she had lost her heart to. Hey, I'm, I'm doing a video. What puppies? Well, puffed George, Judge Cormos, easing his bulky frame onto a bench under the apple tree. Last night when I went to Ver Verati's with my heart in my boots, to be frank, to take her home, I fully expected one of her tantrums. After all, she had never been dumped into a pile of straw before. And you know what I found? There she was, nestled in the straw with Verati's old dog licking her face and a lap full of pups swarming all over that precious Paris model of a dress. Then Verati had to speak out of turn and tell her she could have the whole litter for all he cared. And, and then the tantrum came. We had to peel those puppies off her. They yelped and their mother howled and Lily out yowled them, the lot of them. He wiped his forehead. I tell you, Martin, it was a riot. Did she want them? Want them? It's all she thinks about and talks about? Little fat ones, breathed Kate, turning an eager face to Judge Cormos. He chuckled, smiling at the thought of those puppies himself. Little fat leaky ones, all brown silk fuzz. Well then, why didn't you bring one along for Lily, asked Father. He sent a sidelong glance toward Kate, or two. Three, grinned Jancy, pointing to himself. I've never had a puppy. Petey was an old dog, and now he is dead. Three, Father? Good. Can I go and get them right now? Me too, please, Uncle Martin, pleaded Kate, tugging at his sleeve. He looked at Judge Cormos, laughing. Will you trust Jancy with your horse and buggy? He's a careful driver. I'd trust Jancy with anything, nodded the judge. And I thank you, Martin, for... But Kate and Jancy didn't hear the rest. They were already in the buggy and off. When a couple hours later they drove into the yard, they saw Lily leaning against the wall, kicking idly at clumps of grass. Hey, Lily, called Kate. Look what we got. Lily shrugged and turned her head away. Jancy threw the reins around the hitching post and lifted a basket out of the buggy. A chorus of yipping complaints started up inside and Lily spun around. What? What have you got there? She asked, her voice half eager, half suspicious. Jancy set down the basket on the shady grass under the apple tree. He winked at Kate because Lily was coming reluctantly at first and then with a sudden rush. Puppies. Why, they're my puppies, she cried, falling on her knees beside the basket. She reached in with both hands and lifted one out, pressing it to her face. This one, he chewed my ear yesterday. Look, he knows me, see? He's chewing me again, she laughed, her face shining with happiness. Then, as Kate beamed back at her, she frowned. Are they yours? We can each have one, said Kate. You pick yours first because you found them. Lily gave a squeal of joy. This is mine, this little nibbling rascal. Oh, I'm so happy now. You know, I've never had a puppy and I always wanted one. And here's a photo of the girls and Jancy with the dogs. So, do, so did I, said Kate and Jancy together, each reaching for a puppy. Lily opened her eyes wide. Honest, I thought you had all kinds of pets here, chickens and lambs and horses. Sure, but you can't hold a horse in your lap and squeeze them like this. Ooh, Jancy began to laugh. Well, it's a good thing you can't do that to a horse. Your pet is leaking. They do, giggled Lily. You should have seen my dress yesterday, but I don't mind. She turned over on her stomach and rubbed her face against the squirming puppy. Rascal. I'll call him Rascal. What will you call yours? Wags, cried Jancy, pointing at his puppy's tiny rear end. It was trying to wag its tail, but his whole round self wagged with it. I c I'll call mine friend, decided Kate and smiled to herself. She turned over too and Jancy followed suit. The three heads bent over the puppies close together. Rascal, wags, and friend, sighed Lily contentedly, and then without looking up, she pushed Kate a little with her shoulder. I was awful mad at you yesterday, but I'm not now. This is fun. The cousin's eyes met for a moment. It was a brief glance, but its meaning was clear to both. Maybe Lily wasn't going to be so bad after all. Want to see my chickens? To an outsider, this would have been a casual question, but all three knew that it was a peace treaty. We could teach you to ride if you'd like to. 
Jancy was doing his share too. Then we could all go and see my herd. And the lambs, hundreds and thousands of them, Lily, like a big white cloud rolling over the meadows. And Pista would tell us stories, nice crispy ones. And the three heads pressed close together and three pairs of legs were kicking and waving in the air. In the center of it, all the three puppies went peacefully to sleep, not at all disturbed by the giggle interspersed talk over their heads. By the time mother called them in for the noonday meal, the three children had made plans enough, not for one summer, but for 10. They prattled, prattled on through the meal, unmindful of the amused glances of the grown-ups. Only Jancy noticed that toward the end of the meal, the men's conversation had taken a serious turn, that the jovial round face of Judge Cormos had lost its smile, and father was frowning. Strange words, sinister words his ear had absorbed while the thoughts were still on their childish plans echoed in his mind now. Words with a vaguely ugly meaning, assassination, rights of minorities, ultimatum to Serbia, mobilization, war. War? Uncle Sandor rose and began to pace the room up and down and up and down. I tell you, he cried, the government is playing with fire. If Austria declares war and we are dragged into it, the country is doomed. The judge grunted, bah, we would crush the Serbs. He pressed a broad thumbnail down on a crumb of bread. Like this, in two weeks, it would all be over. And why, sh why should we, demanded Uncle Sandor hotly. What have we got against the Serbs? Just because a fanatic, a misled, misguided youngster has killed the man who was the symbol of Austrian threats, Austrian greed and domination, is that the reason enough for plunging two countries into war? Would a war give his life back to him? His voice broke, his hands dropped, and he began to pace the room again. Jancy's puzzled eyes turned to father. He was still frowning, his face set and dark, more serious than Jancy had ever seen it. He was looking straight at Jancy, but it was many moments before a glimmer of a smile showed in his eyes, and then it came slowly as if it had to fight its way through dark clouds of worry. Jancy, why don't you and Kate show Lily the garden? She could pick some flowers for Judge Cormos to take home, he said. Run along, he added almost impatiently when Jancy didn't move. Then gently, run along, son, while the sun is still shining. The children went, and as the door closed on them, Kate laughed. Uncle Martin must be all mixed up. It's only noon, and the sun won't go down for ages. Tell you what, let's go down to the brook first and pick forget-me-nots. She looked at Jancy. Hey, old somber face, what are you frowning about? What your father said, began Jancy, but she tweaked his nose. Oh, Daddy, he's forever preaching. Don't you know him yet? Come on. That was two months ago. Since then, the puppies had grown to almost twice their size. Now they were awkward little dogs, rollicking, romping, getting into everybody's way and chewing to rags, everything chewable. Three little clowns who could bring laughter to father's face and sometimes chase away the worried wrinkles from Sandor Nagy's forehead. Not always. For in those two months, those vaguely sinister words, ultimatum, mobilization, war, had become realities for all. Hungary was at war. Not only Hungary, all of Europe. Since July 28, when Austria-Hungary had declared war on Serbia, every day, every mail that reached the village had brought news of more and more countries declaring war on one another. Russia against Austria-Hungary, Germany against France, England against Germany. At first, this news was only words too, little black words printed on paper. But as time went on, they took on life and began to move, became the marching feet of men, the rumbling wheels of train and cannon. One evening after supper, at the end of a blazing, breathless August day, the family was sitting under the apple tree. They had been out in the wheat field since dawn. Even Lily had worked along with Kate, carrying water to the hired men and women, helping to take care of babies whom their mothers had brought along. It had been the last day of harvest. Now all the wheat and rye fields lay bare and brown, and the barns were full of golden grain. Lily rolled over and over on the grass, trying to hide her sunburned nose from Rascal's too friendly tongue. She sat up, hugging the ecstatic little dog to her. Oh, rascal, isn't this fun, honestly? She sent a shining smile at father. I've never been this happy in my life, Uncle Martin. I don't want to go back to school. Couldn't I stay, please, forever and ever? Father smiled and rumpled her already rumpled blonde curls. That isn't for me to say, Lily. We would like to keep you forever and ever and ever, but you'll have to ask your father. Lily pouted. You can't talk to him now. He always looks as black as thunder and talks about drafts and enlistments and things. War is a nuisance anyway. It changes people. To say the least, said Kate's father with a dry little chuckle. Father only sighed. He had been answering questions all day, the worried, puzzled questions of his men. What are they fighting about, Mr. Nagy? Do we have to go to war too? Will I have to leave my wife, my children? What will become of them? Who will take care of them? They all came to him and he answered as well as he could, promising to take care of their families in case they'd have to go, but evading the one question that was uppermost in their minds. What are they fighting about? To that, he didn't know the answer. His thoughts were interrupted by one sharp bark and two answering growls. 
Rascal Wags and friend broke away from the family circle and galloped across the yard, making enough noise for one medium-sized watchdog. Jancy peered through the hazy dusk. It's your father's buggy, Lily. Hello, over here, Judge Cormos, under the tree, he shouted. A dark figure alighted from the buggy and moved toward the tree. Father rose and said, that isn't Judge Cormos. He's too thin. Aaron, is that you? Spurs clinked and Aaron said in a low voice, Reserve Lieutenant Aaron Mendeboom since this morning. I have been called. Another wedding? Cried Kate and clapped her hands against her lips as the truth suddenly dawned on her. The dark eyes in Aaron's face turned toward her and he smiled. I wish it were, little Kate. Or maybe it is. He added in a strange voice, The devil's, the devil's own wedding with death for a fiddler. Then he addressed himself to father again. I received orders to take the first unit out of our territory tomorrow. All men between 22 and 30. I am to take them to Budapest for distribution to their own regiments. Then I have to join my regiment on the Russian front. We leave at noon, he added after a little silence. Martin Nagy brushed his head across, hand across his forehead. Let's go inside. I'd want to talk to you. I'd rather not, said Aaron almost gruffly. I have to go right back. I only came to ask you to come in tomorrow if you can. Why, of course we'll come to see you off. We will all go in, cried Mother. Thank you. I hoped you would. I counted on it. Aaron's voice sounded strangely, strangely constrained, and they couldn't see his face now. I may not have time to say goodbye tomorrow or ask you to do a great favor for me, so I'm asking you now. Anything we can do, began Father. I know. This. He held out a white envelope to Father. This is the favor. Please open it after I've left, not before. I want you to promise not before I'm out of the village. Of course, I promise, said Father, taking the envelope. Aaron sighed deeply. You will understand why I'm burdening you with this. It takes a strong man to carry that envelope where it has to go, stronger than I am. And so I will just say until we meet again, and thank you. He went, spurs clinking across the dark yard, and soon the yellow lanterns on the buggy disappeared between the poplars on the lane. And so next morning, the family left again to drive drive into the village with a wagon full of flowers. Kate and Lily had gathered all the bla blazing red and yellow zinnias, roses, deep blue corn flowers, fragrant rosemary, sweet mignette. They stripped the garden of all its bloom to make up countless small type bouquets. There were enough for all the men who were leaving, enough to throw under the horse's feet as the wagons, filled with singing, waving man, began to roll out of the village. All the little gardens must have been stripped bare because when the wagons had disappeared behind, behind clouds of dust, the whole long village street was covered with flowers. Uncle Moses was still waving long after Aaron had ridden off behind the last wagon and he wiped his eyes stealthily. Don't cry, Mama. He smiled into Aunt Sarah's brimming eyes. Don't you cry. Be glad like I am. Our son makes a fine Hungarian officer. He is going to fight for our country, Mama. Be proud of him. Kate turned around. They'd all been standing in front of the store and he saw that Sarah was groping for a handkerchief. She made a move to give her one, but Lily was quicker. Lily, her own eyes brimming, had one arm around Aunt Sarah's shoulders and was wiping her face gently. He wore your flowers over his heart, Lily was saying. Did you see Aunt Sarah? And he let me kiss him goodbye, too. I kissed all of them goodbye. For luck. The glances of Kate and Jancy met and parted to exchange brief messages of surprise with the rest of the family. They all thought the same thing, but only Jancy put it into words. Who would have believed that, he said, shaking his head, a little as if he couldn't believe what he saw. Somewhere, somehow, in the past two months, they had lost that Lily, the flouncing, peevish, bored Lily, and they found this sunburned little girl to whom Aunt Sarah was clinging now, saying, I'm sure it will bring them luck, my child. People began to drift back to their homes, and Mother was getting restless. I've got to do my washing today, or you won't have a clean shirt for Sunday, she reminded Father. They were driving out of the village when Father stopped the horses and drew Aaron's white envelope out of his pocket. Let's see what this mysterious package is, he smiled, ripping it open, and a small golden disc with a red ribbon on it fell out and clattered on the floor wagon. Jancy picked it up. For conspicuous bravery in the presence of the enemy, he read slowly, turning the little shining disc around and around, and then he looked up quickly because Mother was asking, what is it, Martin, what is it? And Father began to read from the slip of white paper he held in his hand. It is a sad duty of the War Department to inform you that your brother... Rabbi Joseph Mandelbaum was killed in the first battle on the Russian front while administering aid to the wounded caught between the firing lines. The last words were hardly more than a whisper drowned in the silence around him. Only the paper rustled as he folded it up carefully, slowly, because his fingers were trembling. The midday sun beat down on the endless plains. Heat rose from the shorn fields and shimmered over the brown stubble. Farther away, sheep were gazing, grazing, and from the scant shade of a lone tree came the plaintive silvery sound of a shepherd's flute. A lark, envious perhaps of the sweet sounds, burst into song, flinging its small body into the air, soaring higher and higher until its song seemed to drift down from heaven itself. 
Little thin Joseph with a silver voice, said Kate's father. Remember, Martin, when we went to school together and the old teacher used to begin every morning with singing? The Magyar hymn. We used to all stand up and bellow our lungs out at first, but Joseph always finished it alone. We just had to listen to that soaring voice of his, of his that could turn a song into a prayer, remember? Father remembered. He rose and began to say the words of the Magyar hymn. God bless all Hungarians with freedom, joy, and prosperity. And somehow the tune crept into his voice, and then all of them were singing, standing with bared heads and folded hands. Help us with thy protecting arms when we fight our enemy. The lone shepherd must have heard them because long after the hymn was ended, his silvery flute echoed the tune and the invisible lark trilled an accompaniment to it from the sky. Son, said Father huskily, you drive home. I have to go back to do what Aaron couldn't do. I am coming with you, said Mother, and the others looked after them as they walked slowly, arm in arm, treading the path of now withered and dusty flowers. Martin Nagy's shoulders were bowed as if he was carrying a heavy weight. Into Kate's mind flashed a memory of just two short months ago and she glanced at her father's face. He must have been thinking the same thing because he said, the tall farmer will never let the Mandelbaums go alone. Not exactly sure who, who Rabbi Joseph Mandelbaum. I'm wondering, I think that's Aaron's brother. I think that's his brother. Um, I think that's old Moses's other son. I'm going to double check that.